Good morning. It would be true to say that uh, the word has already been preached this morning. It's been a fantastic service so far. Ladies and gents, it's great to be back here at Northreach. For those of you who don't know who I am or haven't met me as yet, you haven't missed out on much. My name is uh, Gary Pope, and my wife, Julie, and I, along with our kids, have been part of this congregation since 2012. Although in the past three years, we have been uh, posted to Singleton down in New South Wales. We left Townsville with six kids at home, and we've come back to Townsville with two. I thoroughly recommend the mobile or transient lifestyle. It encourages your kids to leave home. It works. <laughs> now, New South Wales is my home state, and I am a keen Blues supporter. So a return posting to Townsville does seem like a re-entry back into enemy territory. Though here at Northreach, I am confident, maybe I shouldn't be, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor, uh, slave nor free, male nor female, maroon supporter nor blue, for we are all one in Christ Jesus, right? Yeah, right, you say. I joined the army as a young bloke shortly after leaving school and have, a, have had a number of roles within the army since that time. Now, most recently as an army chaplain, a role that certainly has its challenges, but one that I love. I was quite adventurous as a young man and loved a whole range of active sports and activities. Now, during my first posting to Canberra, a few of my mates and I would go caving in the nearby Reed Jasper or Wombian Caves from time to time. Now, thankfully, one of us, not me, was a very experienced spelunker and knew what he was doing. During one trip, we were down in a maze of caves and were transitioning from one cavern to another, one situ situated directly below us. There were two routes to this cavern. The shortest one required a descent almost straight down through a shaft. There were permanent straps in place to help with this descent. The other route was decidedly longer, but was more fun. It involved uh, heading down some narrow passages and uh, finished with a corkscrew slip and slide into the cavern. The only problem with this route was it involved some fairly tight squeezes. Now, our leader recommended this particular route, but he said to one of our mates that because, let's say, he was a little bit more generous in girth than the rest of us, that perhaps he'd be best taking the short route and that we'd meet him at the bottom of the shaft. So my slightly tubby-up mate popped down the hole while the rest of us headed through the other route. When we met back up with our friend, it was clear he was not okay. He was sitting very pensively with his head down and was struggling to engage with us. When he had regained enough composure, he told us what had happened. He was halfway down the shaft when his headlamp suddenly went out. He was in complete dark darkness, a darkness so complete that there is not even the slightest perception of light. And because he was hanging from a strap, he had no way to stop and sought out his headlamp. Now, to his credit, he didn't panic. He still had hold of that strap by which he could lie himself down bit by bit. But the frightening part came when his feet could no longer touch the sides of the shaft because he had emerged into the ceiling of the cavern. He was just dangling from the strap, and the strap had run out. He had no idea what was below him, no idea how far the floor of the cavern was. He had no idea if the strap was supposed to be this short or whether it had broken off. Here he was, suspended and twisting in the complete darkness, slowly losing his grip, calling out for help into the black void and hearing nothing in return. This morning, ladies and gents, is a message about the desperation of darkness and the hope of light. In the beginning, 
was the Word, and the Word was God. Through him all things were made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Gospel of John is unique amongst the four Gospels, and one reason why it is different to the others is that he draws upon rich motifs, predominantly the dualistic motif of light and darkness. Now, sure, the use of light and darkness to describe good and bad, etc., is not uncommon in ancient texts, but John's use of these metaphors is rich, complex, and grand. But for starters, let me read from the third chapter of John, our passage for this morning, John 3, verse, uh, verses 16 through to 21. Now remember, these verses came as part of the event when Nicodemus, the expert in Jewish theology, came to Jesus in the darkness of night. And Jesus gave him an enlightening and blunt lesson in a theology of salvation. And that moves into a verse you may have heard previously. Stop me if you know this one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Sound familiar? The trouble is, though, we often stop here. What comes next? And we miss out on an amplification of this verse. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But... Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue in our service of worship this morning, open our hearts and our minds to your word. Enlighten us by the light of Christ that what may be hidden beyond our ignorance may be revealed through your wisdom. Give us the the humility to respond to your revelation and continue your mission of piercing the darkness with your light. Amen. Now, the most striking parts of this passage may not be immediately apparent to us in today's world. In the time and place where these events happened, the message of these verses were absolutely groundbreaking. The nation of Israel was once again under the dark domination of another nation, this time the Romans. God had apparently gone silent in the darkness. And when God finally speaks again, the message is revolutionary. You see, the Old Testament certainly speaks about God's love, but it's primarily focused on his chosen people, Israel. Now, it is absolutely made plain that God is making eternal life available for everyone. And what is the reason he is doing this? Because he loves the whole world. Jews, Gentiles, the despised Samaritans, even the reviled Romans, maybe even Maroon supporters. Now, we're used to this reality of God's universal love today. But it was hard hitting. And this message of extraordinary hope was hard to comprehend at this time. So what does God's love look like? Well, another way of saying this verse is, 
This is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son. Love in the Bible, ladies and gents, it's not about emotion. It's not about feelings. Biblical love is an action. God loves not just stated in words, but through his self-giving action of sacrifice so that everyone in the world has the opportunity for eternal life. When we speak of Christian love for the world, we need to have this self-sacrificial, self-giving action for the sake of others, prominent in our thinking. More on that later. Now, the next couple of verses are important because it gives us greater insight into God's heart. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. It is the state of condemnation that is the darkness from which God seeks to move people from. When we talk about movement from darkness, we're talking about movement from condemnation to salvation. It's that simple. God is not in the business of condemnation, ladies and gents, and nor should we be. He's in the business of salvation. His loving intent, his heart, his passion is to have everyone brought from the darkness of the condemnation that we all start off in and move into the light of eternal life in relationship with God. And that should be our passion as well. Verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. Jesus is the light. We hear it time, time and again. At the start of John's gospel, we are told the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John 8, 12 records Jesus speaking to the people, saying very clearly, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And a little bit later, in John 12, 46, Jesus says, I've come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. John 9, 5, Jesus said, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But what does that mean? What does it mean Jesus is the light of the world? I mentioned before that John uses the motif of light and darkness in a, such a rich way. And the way that he de does this is by drawing upon all the ways the motif of light is used in the Old Testament and combining them in the person of Jesus. It's sort of like how an inverted prism recombines the colour spectrum into white light. You see, throughout the Old Testament and in the belief system of the Jewish people, the symbol of, of light referred to a number of aspects about God. The light referred to God's very presence. It referred to his salvation, to the law that he had given. It referred to God's wisdom and his word. John takes this motif of light, all these various ways of uh, describing God attributes from the Old Testament and applies it directly to Jesus. In doing so, he unapologetically and in the clearest of terms, for his Jewish readers, he presents Jesus as the very fulfillment of these attributes of God. Ladies and gents, who is Jesus? As the light of the world, he is the presence of God. Jesus is God's salvation for humanity and he is the only way to salvation. Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament law. He is God's wisdom and he is the very word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In him was life and that life was the light of all humankind. Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness and the dar darkness has not, cannot, will not ever overcome it. Now imagine that, I imagine that most of us here this morning have responded to the light of Jesus and stepped from darkness into the light of eternal life, a conscious and deliberate decision to believe and follow Jesus. So what is the application part of this message? 
Well, how about a message direct from Jesus to you? Let's just jump out of John and into the Gospel of Matthew, where in chapter 5, he records Jesus saying to his followers back then, and he says to us today, a message from the light of the world, Jesus says to us, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Northreach, by the grace, by the wisdom of God, we are the light of the world. And we're commanded by our Lord, let the light that he's put in us shine before others. Now, you might think that you do not have much to offer and any light that you provide is a feeble flickering in the dark. Many years ago, as a brand new, wet behind the ears, uh, wet behind the ears lieutenant, I was moving between two platoons uh, at night, two platoon locations. Now the distance wasn't far, and in my arrogance, I was confident in the direction I was going, and uh, I didn't bother taking a compass bearing, confident that I'd run into that other position. Unfortunately. I didn't run into that other position, and I found myself lost. However, army officers uh, can't use the word lost. We use the word geographically embarrassed. <laughs> now, the night was dark. There was no moonlight. I had no night vision goggles, no torch, and had lost all sense of direction. The darkness started to get heavy, and I was scared of the embarrassment and the shame of being that officer who got lost in the night. A growing feeling of anticipated condemnation. Eventually, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flickering of light from an ill-disciplined soldier lighting a cigarette. Thank God for him. <laughs> and that one brief moment of feeble light glow pierced the darkness. It gave me direction. It gave me a bearing and a sense of relief and comfort in the darkness that I was in. In our modern world, with such readily and abundant light available, it's easy to forget how terrifying darkness can be and just how comforting and direction-giving a source of light, however small, can be. Likewise, those of us who enjoy living in the light and comfort of being part of God's family, being part of a life-saving community, forget just how dark and lonely it can be on the outside. It is so important that you do not underestimate that which you have to give to others. Even the briefest of flashes from a lighter can provide life-giving guidance, your act of kindness, a gentle word, an invitation, being hospitable, your intercessory prayer, your giving to charity, the smallest of lights perhaps, but of such rich value. And it is so important that as a church community, we do not underestimate the extraordinary value we have brought and we continue to bring to Townsville and beyond. We are living in a time in Australia where the value of Christianity is often openly questioned. It is fashionable to bag Christianity, and we may even feel embarrassed to admit association with a church community. There is certainly bad press out there. Ladies and gents, I do not doubt and I mourn the despicable harm that has been done by many who claim to follow Jesus. The sinful hypocritical and evil actions that give Christians or the church a bad name need to be denounced in the loudest of voices. But we also need to be resolute in our belief that when we bear the true light of Christ, it is good for the world and we do bring glory to our living God. 
There's a growing number of encouraging books being written at the moment that highlight this. This one from a prominent journalist, Greg Sheridan. It's called God is Good for You, A Defense of Christianity in Troubled Times. And uh, just a portion of the back cover reads, The Judeo-Christian tradition has created and underpinned the moral and legal fabric of Western civilization for more than 2,000 years. Yet now we've reached a point in both Australia and many parts of the rest where Christianity has become a minority faith rather than mainstream belief. It's a situation that's fraught both for Christians and our wider society, where the moral certainties that were the foundation of our institutions and laws are no longer held by the majority. At this point of crisis for faith, this book shows us why Christianity is so vital for our personal and our social and community well-being, and how modern Christians have never worked so hard to make the world a better place when their faith has never been less valued. We often hear that faith is no longer relevant. As a chaplain, I'm aware that some question the ongoing relevancy of chaplains in the Defence Force in our schools, in our prisons, in the court system, in sporting clubs, etc. Then why am I and all my chaplains so busy? The reality is, ladies and gents, the more secular, the more irreligious, the more unbelieving our society becomes, the more relevant that Christianity and its mission of light become. So be encouraged. The darker the night is, the more noticeable even the faintest of lights become. So how do you let your light shine? How do we let our light shine as a church? Well, this question is way more complicated and way more simple than we might think. I believe just like Christian communities all over Australia, we do need to be really challenging ourselves in thinking through, in strategizing, in praying and becoming more creative in how we reach those lost in the darkness. That's the complicated part. And our prayers need to be with our community leaders, our church leaders. But the key to the simple part has already been spoken to us through the Bible passage this morning. For God so loved the world that selflessly he sent his one and only son. Jesus loved the world, so loved the world that he selflessly sent his church. We are the light that has been sent into the darkness. And the way that we shine is by selflessly loving others in the same way Jesus loved others and in the way Christian communities have been loving others ever since. Ladies and gents, we feed the hungry. We bring healing to those who are sick. We give to the poor. We love the unlovely. We serve the marginalised. We give hope to the hopeless. We bless our enemies. We welcome refugees. We visit those behind bars. Ours is not to condemn, but to show what a life of freedom looks like through love. We are to demonstrate and proclaim the good news of Jesus and to never, ever deny him who has brought us out of darkness and into the light and given us eternal life. Let's love our community. Ladies and gents, this month is May Mission Month, as we've heard, a month in which we often focus attention on just some of those mission ministries we support. Often those who have been sent from amongst us, a good thing to do. And yet, how much brighter would the North Reach light be if every one of us, with the same intent as our sent missionaries, consciously let our light shine by loving others in self-giving ways every day. It's exciting. And for those of you here this morning who are yet to respond to Jesus, why not? Perhaps you're fully aware of the light that he is, but are yet to step from the darkness, skirting along the edge in the shadows, just needing the courage to take that final step. What's stopping you? 
Yes, it's hard to hide in the light, but believe me, it is the source of life. Let today be that day. And so to close, I want to provide a testimony of encouragement for us as Northridge. It's a testimony of a mate of mine named Troy. Now, Troy had had no Christian influence in his upbringing. Troy was a rough and tough infantry sergeant posted to Laverack Barracks here in Townsville. He worked hard and he played hard. When he wasn't working, by his own admission, he was drinking. He had the sense that his life was going nowhere. He still lived on base. He saw himself becoming that typical cranky warrant officer who hated everybody. Not a bright future. He was like so many, hanging midair, spinning in the darkness, crying out in the void. His platoon commander was a young man who was part of this community who let his light shine. He invited Troy to, be, uh, to come along to the Good Friday Easter service in 2004. And Troy heard another light from Northreach, Lester Kelly, preach. Apparently his message was blunt and spoke directly to Troy's heart of his, star, of his stark state of darkness and the power and light of God's grace. Troy stepped out of darkness into light. His recollection of Northreach was that it was full of, full of real people who were nothing like the Ned Flanders he imagined. He was given the bright light of God's word and he began to devour it. He was connected into a young adults group, another bunch of Northreach lights. Amongst them was his future wife, Kylie, who Troy describes as his lighthouse. She explained the challenging parts of scripture and made up scripture flashcards to help Troy remember. Troy was discipled, educated in how to live a life walking in the lighted path of God's truth. This life was not about being religious, but about living a life motivated by love. Troy recalls another light of Northreach, a Dutch man, Rudy, who led an exceptional life of example. And as time went on, the light within Troy began to grow bright, and the army agreed. The army saw the light that had been kindled in Northridge and agreed to send Troy to Bible college, all expenses paid, to become an army chaplain. I first met Troy in 2012, uh, a couple of months after we both were first appointed as chaplains. There was no sign of the angry, drunk, loveless, lost man that Troy feared he, had be, uh, he was becoming. The light of Jesus had transformed him. A more gentle, well-mannered, self-giving, loving, hard-working, light-filled, humorous, humble, and generous man of integrity would be hard to find. In the nine years Troy was an army chaplain, he was awarded two commendations in recognition by the army of the love that he had for soldiers, for his pastoral care and his selfless service. When I was uh, posted down to the School of Infantry down in Singleton, I often had staff members come up to me who had been posted with Troy in recent years, and they spoke in glowing terms of all that he had done and given during exceptionally hard circumstances. On a short deployment to Afghanistan a few years ago, I met Americans who had met Troy when he had been deployed to Kabul over a year earlier. They spoke of a man whose ministry of light had impacted them. I too have been impacted by Troy's ministry of light. He sets an example to other chaplains in how to inhabit, how to inhabit the darkness of the typical soldier's world, but to keep the light of Christ burning brightly. How to walk the walk and talk the talk of Jesus and staying relevant without walking the walk and talking the talk of the average soldier. Troy has been an incredible light within the army and has kindled light wherever he's gone, around Australia and the world. 
he is now finishing off his psychology degree so as to become a Christian psychologist to continue lighting lights in the darkness. I believe his good deeds of bringing glory to God have just begun. Where was Troy's light first lit? Here, at Northreach. Ladies and gents, Jesus is the light of the world. But just remember his words to you. Because Jesus is our light. You. You are the light of the world. Let your light of love shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and bring glory to our Father. Amen.